Welcome to the Exact Pro Systems YouTube channel. Here you can catch up on the latest technology updates in software testing and development for the financial industry. These include the applications of AI and machine learning, DLT, cloud computing, and many other technologies and solutions. You can find the recordings of our latest conferences featuring top-level speakers from global market infrastructures, world-leading banks, and technology vendors. You can watch the Exact Pro experts sharing their insights with the fintech community at events all around the world and with our subscribers in the regular Exact Pro Talks segment. If you're interested in the Exact Pro test tools released to open source, you'll find a list of tutorials here as well. We also put a new spin on some of the popular shows that we bet you've never thought were about software testing. This channel is for chief technology information and compliance professionals, product owners, and software quality assurance and development specialists of all levels. Subscribe to our channel, hit the bell button to stay up to date on all the videos, and visit our website execpro.com if you want to learn more about us. Good morning and good day and good afternoon, um, dear participants. Uh, welcome to the third day of conference TMPA 2021. Last two days of the conference were very interesting, full of discussions and insights. And uh, I have good news uh, for all participants, uh, not, uh, I'm sorry, for all speakers um, who were actively participated in our conference, I mean speakers, with their presentations, will receive a certificate of participants and also some gifts. We have uh, little gifts uh, for speakers 
Um, and uh, please stay in touch with our organizing committee. We will send you emails and you should fill some uh, forms, uh, uh, including your address, home address, and we will send you these gifts. So um, today uh, we will continue our work at uh, the conference with the keynote speaker. Alexey Hrashilov, lead researcher at uh, Ivanikov Institute for System Programming of the Russian Academy of Science. Hello, Alexey. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, let's begin. Thank you very much. So, today uh, I would like to present uh, some additional details about experience that we had in Linux Verification Center of uh, Ivanikov Institute for System Programming of Russian Academy of Science, an application of testing, uh, various testing approaches to operating systems. Uh, <coughs> we just discussed uh, different approaches to formal methods uh, with static verification and dynamic verification. And of course, uh, we uh, have well known differences between these approaches. I just recall briefly that, of course, uh, dynamic verification and testing cannot help us to uh, check system under test on all possible paths of. Uh, on all possible executions, but uh, it also uh, have some other uh, complications. For example, it uh, requires real hardware and test data and test environments to be developed uh, to uh, perform verification uh, in dynamic. But at the same time, uh, it have uh, also um, good benefits because we almost have no false positives in dynamic verification while for static verification it's quite <coughs> often problem and at the same time it is uh, the most uh, uh, realistic uh, pro uh, uh, approach to uh, check behavior of system under test in real conditions and doesn't have any uh, assumptions that we uh, have in verification tools that emulate execution of tests in static verification. So now let's us consider uh, some of our experience and uh, application of different techniques of in uh, testing of operating system and for uh, first example, I take very simple function of uh, uh, memCPI. It's well known functions, maybe even not part, a kind of uh, uh, library function, then uh, function from some core functionality of uh, operating system, but it's uh, just for simple example. And let's consider just uh, single test case that we would develop manually to test it in one particular point. We just call a function on with some uh, data and uh, check results uh, with uh, some assertions. That single test case, very obvious. Uh, of course, <laughs> if we try to test a function uh, in more, uh test situation we have to develop a number of such test cases and the first uh, problem that we have here if we have a lot of uh, similar code uh, of, it's became difficult to maintain it's difficult to uh, introduce some changes because we have a lot of copy past uh, functionality and the first obvious idea is just to uh, when we would like to develop not only one test by high quality test suite checking 
for uh, target functionality is to have some uh, tem uh, templates. And uh, when we start this approach, we developed a uh, long time ago uh, a T2C framework for developing such uh, tests. But an, um, in addition to uh, just the problem of a maintenance of uh, a test suite and development of tests, another problem that we have to keep in mind is uh, a management of uh, requirements that we would like to check in our tests. And for that, we have to systemize these uh, requirements or build a catalog of these requirements. And if we look at the function in uh, MCPI, we have a specification uh, of this function in uh, standard of C programming language or in POSIX that may be quite simple. As you can see here, uh, excerpt from uh, POSIX, uh, but nevertheless, we can uh, extract a couple of requirements to the function. And the first requirement is that it have to copy uh, bytes. The second requirement is regarding a return value of this function. And also, uh, in this function, we have actually some prerequisites when this function can be called. That is, uh, uh, in this case, it um, data objects uh, that we uh, cope from and uh, copy to should not overlap. And this uh, actually a precondition to call this function. And then uh, we uh, consider very important uh, step to develop high quality test suite is to develop cat requirements catalog for uh, site for system under test and only in this case we can uh, design test suite that we would check all these requirements and we can trace tests to these requirements and can evaluate which requirements were tested and which are not <coughs> Uh, for that of uh, uh, for, for for this activity, we have developed a uh, open source tool, Requality. It's available from our uh, uh, website and, and the Apache license to design such requirements catalogs based on uh, text uh, in, that we have in various specifications. Uh, when we can extract uh, some sentences from specification and build a, a tree of requirements to, that then can be used during testing. And coming back to uh, building tests themselves, uh, the first approach that could apply uh, when we would like have not only one test case but a number of test cases uh, is to uh, use templates where we have uh, all uh, uh, steps uh, parameterized. As we can see uh, here in this uh, example, we just parameterized uh, code of a single test case uh, with uh, parameters uh, like uh, uh, S1, S2, S, uh, uh, S, S, S uh, offset of uh, uh, input uh, data in the, uh, the buffer and things like that. And when we have uh, this uh, uh, parameterize uh, with uh, some of uh, uh, preparation code and finalization code, we can uh, have a enumeration of different parameters uh, separately from test case and uh, have an instantiation of this test case for many uh, combinations of these parameters. And uh, that help us to uh, generate uh, a number of test cases from a single source. 
And another important element here is the traceability of uh, elements in and steps in test case uh, to requirements catalog that are uh, described here in REC uh, macro that uh, refer to identifier of requirements from requirements catalog and uh, responding assertion. The first assertion is a, a checking precondition that we don't uh, call function under test in the conditions that is uh, prohibited by specification. And the second or third uh, rec or check uh, actual requirements to behave of the function under test. And uh, using this approach, we uh, designed to see the development uh, process that apply to uh, Linux standard based libraries from LSB desktop uh, and develop uh, an, a number of uh, tests for uh, different uh, libraries in uh, Linux uh, distributions. But when we would like to do more throughput uh, testing with uh, much uh, more test cases and checking that uh, our system under test in uh, different situations, we uh, choose to apply model-based testing framework and that was done during all the pro other project. So let me uh, briefly describe how it works and basic ideas of this approach. Uh, the target system in that case was the core part of LSB uh, that implements basic functionality that's specified in this uh, specification. It's actually mostly de described in POSIX standard. And uh, uh, the same uh, as I showed before, uh, we <coughs> apply requirements uh, catalog a step as the first step for test uh, development uh, and uh, after that we uh, uh, apply uh, unitask model-based testing technology to design a uh, tests and here uh, we uh, uh, can see on the slide a, sp a specification template that was generated as a specification for MCPI function uh, automatically generated from requirements catalog when we uh, extract uh, a precon uh, no, I'm sorry when we extracted requirements applied to uh, caller of the function and to the function itself and in this template we put requirements of the first kind to precondition and the requirements of the second um, Kind to a post condition. Uh, and uh, here uh, is a uh, complete precondition for that function in uh, <coughs> specification extension of C programming language implemented in CTESC2, uh, where uh, we have a specification for MemCPI. And uh, here we uh, can see that in uh, signature of a function, in addition to uh, normal uh, parameters that we have in the specific in the uh, function under test, we have also additional parameter call context, uh, which actually describe where this function is called. Because during development of this uh, uh, over the suite. We designed distributed architecture when uh, <coughs> actual uh, test execution is performed on target system using over test engine uh, that works on that system. But uh, all test engines and test uh, machinery uh, works on a separate host si system where we <coughs> uh, run over the suite in separate processes, we, we can uh, run uh, this uh, process uh, of test generation. We uh, check results uh, on this host system 
and we can have a number of uh, over test engines working in different processes on system under test and that is why we have additional call context uh, uh, argument that describe in which context uh, function under test should be called <laughs> for memcpi function maybe it is not uh, very important element and we don't use it because it's very simple example but for functions that uh, have for example uh, inter-process communications uh, and so on uh, of course it uh, make a big importance and also it uh, within one scenario we uh, work in different processes and that is done through this parameter also uh, you can see that we don't use native uh, type system like void ptl uh, because uh, we use special uh, model types uh, that describe uh, void ptl on target system uh, in our model that can be executed on a, a cpu with another architecture if we look at uh, precondition uh, actually, uh, precondition is a function that return true if a uh, uh, function under test is called in situation, then it's uh, possible to call it. And uh, uh, rec macro is actually a uh, simple macro that check uh, condition and uh, return true, return false if it does not uh, satisfy it and uh, put into trace some additional information about uh, a requirement that was checked by this macro and some additional uh, comments from test developer. Also, uh, the second part of the specification is post condition. It's also a function that return Boolean value. It returns true if uh, uh, after uh, behavior of, system, of function under test satisfy to our requirements and uh, return false if uh, it does not. Here we already have access to a return value of this function uh, that is uh, used, to, that is accessible with special identifier um, uh, MMCPI underscore spec here that is name of a function uh, you can see here in memcpy o3 check and also we have uh, here access to a post state of uh, function under test and when we would like to uh, get access to state of uh, system before the call of function we use a special at mark uh, that uh, allows us to compare uh, state before uh, call of function on the test and after that. So here uh, we have a post condition that check all the requirements. Uh, and you can see here that some of requirements uh, have a reference to the catalog of requirements uh, from POSIC specification, but also we add some other uh checks that are uh, not explicitly stated there for example that uh, the first object should not change and that is uh, some uh, additional uh, check that was uh, introduced in, uh, in test development uh, by test designer uh, now, if we look how it works uh, for uh, test uh, process, uh, we <coughs> could see that uh, from the specification that I just presented to you, we generate automatically uh, C code uh, of test oracles uh, that is used to uh, check precondition and postcondition in runtime and uh, produce a verdict about uh, behavior of system under test another important uh, element of unitask uh, test architecture is uh, a test generation 
uh, uh, question. So uh, how to uh, produce a checking of uh, functionality of system under test in uh, various test situation to call functions in various parameters. And for that, uh, we uh, use <coughs> automatic test generation based on uh, some input data provided by test designer. So it's not complete automatically test generation, but it's some automation. Test designer have to uh, design to define uh, two main elements uh, for test for each test scenario. The first element is uh, abstract state uh, that uh, represent uh, which state of uh, uh, system under test we would like to consider as a different state. And uh, uh, a second element is a set of test actions that we would like to execute in each uh, abstract state. And test engine automatically generate from this uh, input data a sequence of actions from the second uh, item uh, to ensure that uh, these actions were executed in each abstract state that we uh, reach during test execution. So it's automatically track current abstract state and uh, apply all uh, test actions uh, in each uh, abstract state. And if we uh, switch after uh, execution of a uh, uh, new test action, uh, the state, abstract state to new one, uh, test engine can generate uh, a sequence of test actions uh, to return to uh, <coughs> previous abstract state and uh, continue enumeration of test actions provided by the designer to achieve the goal. Let's consider how it works on another example from POSIX where we uh, have found quite interesting uh, bug uh, that was quite difficult to find by manual test uh, design, but of course possible, but it's not an obvious situation. And, and in this case, uh, when we have POSIX uh, message queue, where we have uh, a queue of messages between two uh, processes uh, of threads, and we have uh, uh, a waiting queue of threads. Uh, it could be threads waiting to send a uh, message and uh, could be friend, uh, could be a threads waiting to receive a message from the MQ. Uh, and uh, in this case, the abstract state that I mentioned uh, before is uh, a triple of uh, numbers, uh, number of messages in the queue, number of threads waiting to send and number of threads waiting to receive. And if we start to uh, execute test actions, uh, if it is abstract state, and for example, we have uh, test actions to uh, send uh, <coughs> uh, a message to the queue and to receive a uh, message from queue, from uh, threads from, with different uh, priorities, uh, we could uh, find the following path uh, in this abstract automata. Uh, that uh, go to situation, then we have a receiver that blocks uh, on uh, uh, the queue. Uh, then we have high priority sender that uh, sent a number of messages to the queue and uh, became uh, blocked on the uh, send. And also, uh, when we have another high priority sender that also block on the send. And after that, uh, we have a receiver that uh, get all messages from the SKU and uh, one of uh, sender is uh, uh, wake, waked up and uh, send uh, this message. Uh, to the receiver, while uh, the second uh, sender uh, in 
one of system that we have tested with these approaches was never uh, unblocked and uh, left in the <coughs> sender queue forever. And then, as you can see, it's quite um, untrivial situation that was automatically uh, achieved by uh, building a test sequence that uh, load through this abstract automata uh, with quite simple definition, just a triple of numbers and uh, several uh, test obvious test actions send and receive from threads with different priorities. And if you look at this test architecture in general, uh, as you can see here, uh, we have a specification on the left side of a test suite that consists of test scenario, uh, specification of uh, functions on the test, and also mediators that translates a call of specification function to a call of a function under test. And in our case, in all our project, the mediator was distributed because it just sent information from uh, test system to uh, system and to another target uh, <coughs> and uh, special agent uh, get this information and call actual function on the test in uh, the uh, system under test. And uh, here uh, on the right side, we have a, a view how it works in runtime. From test scenario, we generate scenario driver and have a pre-built uh, test engine that perform uh, uh, test second generation and uh, uh, <coughs> travers uh, abstract automata uh, during uh, runtime. And uh, also from specification, we generate test uh, uh, data model of uh, system and the test oracle uh, that uh, perform a checking of correctness of behavior of system and the test, and also a special component that uh, check coverage of uh, formal specifications for the system and the test uh, that uh, can be used to generate test reports, uh, test coverage reports uh, with uh, <coughs> different views. Here is a view of uh, coverage. Uh, of requirements catalog uh, in tree view. Uh, also, we could generate uh, coverage of requirements catalog in uh, highlighting of original text uh, of uh, specification because we have uh, in inequality tool uh, traceability between uh, tree of requirements or catalog of requirements and the original text or a specification that we used to extract this uh, requirements catalog. <coughs> and uh, also we can uh, build a, a report cover, uh, coverage report about elements of uh, specification. Here we have some summary of uh, and statistics on the other uh, project that we had. Uh, we had uh, uh, look uh, of that already. So, uh, and also uh, we discussed some uh, <coughs> conclusions that this model-based testing approach allows to achieve quite uh, good quality with less resources, but, uh, and, and it also, uh, it's quite cheap to maintain in terms of uh, uh, good test architecture and uh, we avoid uh, a lot of copy paste that we um, could have if uh, design uh, test suite ju just as a set of independent test cases. But of course, have a significant drawback uh, that uh, only uh, the ones and test engineers can maintain and develop of with uh, tests, and uh, that is why we had some problems with uh, maintainability actually of these tests, uh, and not maybe not maintainability, but 
uh, to pass these tests to operating system uh, developers because uh, it's not always uh, trivial to debug uh, uh, problems that this tests uh, found in the system under tests and uh, they actually have uh, <coughs> a problem with application of these tests uh, without our team and uh, uh, traditional tests of course are much more uh, useful for typical test engineer and developers out of that works in, in the field but at the same uh, time so so uh, uh, as a result long-term efficiency of this approach is a, a kind of questionable uh, because uh, of this problem <coughs> but nevertheless in this other project we will, uh, have uh, some positive uh, feedbacks when uh, this test were open sourced and used in LSB, LSB Linux standard based uh, uh, certification process and some uh, China uh, test engineers from China distribution that uh, pass uh, certification in uh, Linux foundation against this test suite uh, have detected some problems in this uh, test case and sent us some patches uh, to scenarios so um, it's a, a kind of positive uh, sign that it's not so bad as uh, uh, we could uh, expect. <coughs> and uh, so when we uh, design test suites for uh, operating systems, uh, we could uh, achieve uh, quite a good uh, quality test suites that check many kinds of bugs uh, on, of course, on, just on some uh, execution paths uh, using these uh, techniques such as uh, requirements traceability and uh, power modification <coughs> in, as in Unitask. But if we look at uh, Linux standard based specification in a whole, we can see that uh, LSB desktop uh, uh, contains uh, not 100, 1050 interfaces as LSB core, but almost two, uh, 20,000 of interfaces. And of course, design uh, high quality tests for uh, such big number of interfaces is a huge project uh, that couldn't be uh, done in a reasonable way. But nevertheless, we have uh, to uh, cover these functions uh, for LSB specification test suite. And if we look at uh, <coughs> Linux library as a whole, we could see that the number of interfaces is so huge. So it's uh, impossible to cover them with high quality in reasonable time. That is why we uh, start to look at another techniques that try to uh, create some very small uh, robustness tests, but covering a uh, big number of interfaces. And in that project, we, of course, target just smoke testing, just check that functionality present in the system and more or less uh, uh, work. And for that, uh, we try to generate tests from uh, just signature of a function on the tests and uh, some additional descriptors providing us additional information. And this additional semantic information contains data how to initialize a uh, library, uh, what is data of particular type valid and uh, which uh, argument maybe have a special uh, requirements <coughs> and maybe some minimal checks for returning type particular types and it looks uh, like uh, this example when we have C uh, like uh, C code with some dollar uh, 
uh, sign uh, expression uh, where we put uh, in this side some uh, type uh, expressions or some <coughs> uh, interfaces and using this uh, uh, special additional information allows us to generate uh, valid test cases for many of functions uh, with uh, uh, minimal uh, duplication of code and uh, that actually works uh, we generate a number of small tests for webxml and uh, Qt uh, functions but of course it works uh, well when we have uh, a large uh, libraries uh, that have very uh, similar interfaces and reuse a lot of uh, similar uh, data types that help us to uh, <coughs> extensively reuse these specifications and uh, uh, in that case this approach uh, works uh, more or less uh, well and uh, even more it allows us to find some bugs uh, in free type for example library and uh, in the libss such as well uh, and these uh, bugs were detected using these uh, smoke tests and uh, fix it uh, in uh, the linux libraries and but of course these uh, tests are very low quality and just uh, to check minimal uh, functionality as far as I have not so uh, many time i will not uh, go into details about uh, systematic aspects of a testing that we could see in these examples and just uh, mention a few uh, additional projects that we had uh, first was is uh, problem that in the operating system we have a number of configuration parameters and uh, this is a uh, configuration parameter for small real-time operating systems that we have tested and uh, for Linux of course we have much bigger numbers and for that we have designed a, some a combinational generation technique to uh, e <coughs> efficiently enumerate this uh, configurations and execute tests in different combinations of uh, configuration parameters that uh, covers all uh, pairs of values and things like that and keep in mind all dependencies between of them that help us to uh, in, increase uh, qual uh, quality of testing of course uh, another example that also I would like to mention is uh, robustness testing where we have to uh, and would like to check not only uh, perform not only actions that it's possible to do outside of system under test but also to inject some faults during execution of system under test because uh, bugs in fault handling code are uh, very uh, often uh, in reality because it's very difficult to test all these full handling paths and uh, they are uh, bugs in this code very seldom happen in practice so developers uh, have low pressure to care about these bugs and we have a number of them uh, in our practice uh, we have maybe uh, 10 num uh 10 bugs in fault handling code against one bug in normal cases in our practice uh, um, so we have designed some systematic enumeration uh, of, of, of fault uh, injection points in this case for file system in linux kernel and systematically enumerate these uh fault po points and introduce uh, inject uh uh false uh <coughs> when uh repeat the same test cases but uh, on uh, new execution we uh, in inject uh fault in next uh point where this injection could be 
uh, introduced and we uh, extracted uh, during uh, observation of behavior system on the test during basic test execution. So time is not so uh, uh, I have no time to go into details so I just present some res results uh, of that and of course that results demonstrate that <coughs> number of bugs and false code is uh, uh, significant uh, oh, another aspect that we would like to uh, pay attention is uh, Oracle problem. When we have fault injection uh, in a system under test, we cannot expect that functionality that we have in uh, original test cases uh, should be behave uh, uh, as it was designed by test designer because uh, of this fault. So we have to don't use uh, these assertions from original test cases, but nevertheless, we have to I check some uh, aspects of behavior of system under test and of course uh, it's a big problem uh, and the uh, obvious approach to solve it is to uh, use some uh, additional uh, <coughs> checks that don't require manual development, like assertion and test code, some uh, sanitizers or additional uh, checkers that we had. Uh, for example, for Linux kernel, a variety number of uh, uh, checkers uh, that can be activated by uh, corresponding configuration options, like log depth subsystem, memory checks, and a number of sanitizers supported. We also developed some additional leak checkers and that help us to uh, <coughs> introduce fault injection and don't develop manually uh, oracle for each uh, uh, scenario with fault injection but just use uh, these automated ones <coughs> and uh, uh, another uh, results from experiments that we execute is that a systematic uh, uh, fault injection is more cost effective uh, and it's more important that it's repeatable in comparison just random fault injection that is uh, the approach that uh, use most uh, situations when fault injection uh, uh, considered and uh, another element uh, that I would like to discuss um, uh, is that from our experience that I presented, we developed over uh, uh, the suite based on Unitask uh, technology with this uh, test architecture. Uh, but uh, for we finished this project maybe in 2010, uh, and uh, after that actually for quite a long time we don't uh, develop uh, and improve uh, this uh, technology and these techniques because we met some issues with uh, uh, deployment uh, results in for, uh, practice uh, because of this complexity of this test suite and problem with test engineers uh, from uh, the field working of them but now we're coming back to model-based testing architecture with uh, uh, maybe <coughs> same ideas but uh, uh, more um, uh, simple cases and maybe simple architecture for uh, maintenance uh, where uh, we don't uh, try to do online uh, verification and online checking of system under test uh, that of course have a number of uh, benefits uh, but too complicated to uh, test engineers and in that case in 
the new model-based uh, test uh, architecture that we now uh, use. We separate test uh, scenario execution and do uh, just a collection of uh, trace from execution of tests and the do offline uh, verification of uh, trace collected uh, separately. And uh, in this case, we can uh, have uh, more uh, tools for uh, visualization of uh, specification checking. Uh, we use, uh, in this case, not specification extension of C for describing requirements, but we use event B. Uh, and that is because we reuse models that we develop for functional specification of uh, uh, system under tests uh, because uh, formal uh, uh, specification of functional requirements uh, is uh, uh, developed sometimes according to common criteria of, uh, requirements or uh, things like that so we uh, can just reuse the same functional specification developed and analyzed in event b for uh, correctness uh, for the test execution and checking that system under test actually uh, correspond to this formal model of requirements that have been developed uh, but at the same time, we have some drawbacks in comparison with previous architecture because we cannot reuse the same formal model uh, in such simple way for test generation. We have to do it uh, with some additional efforts. So, but now this process is uh, ongoing and we have already worked with this technique for testing Linux. Uh, and uh, also there are a couple of topics that are out of scope of this presentation because I have no time, but uh, are important for uh, testing of operating systems uh, because, for example, uh, the system execution of all these tests have to be automated and we have to uh, manage uh, a number of devices where uh, we have to execute these tests. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Alexei. Uh, we have some questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, seems such presented language for MPM CPY specifications is a syntactic sugar for AC ACSL specs, or you can offer more expressiveness. Uh, you can read yes. uh, this question. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I, I see. So, mm -hmm. yes, it's quite close to uh, CSL, but uh, it was uh, designed before CSL. So it was designed in uh, 2004, maybe. Uh, but uh, we... Uh, have uh, just uh, in our approach because we developed uh, the, uh, this specification uh, separately from the code. Uh, of course, for CSL is also possible, uh, but uh, uh, <coughs> uh, also I would like to mention that we, of course, start to use CSL when it uh, start be be become available. But for uh, static verification uh, tools, and uh, we consider uh, how to combine this uh, language to uh, our uh, test, uh, new generation model based testing engine. Um, so it's a very uh, valid note. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions. Uh, so, 
thank you for your work at this conference. Um, I hope to see you again um, at another our conferences. So, Alexei, uh, goodbye. Thank you, bye. Thank you. And now let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, Chun Yu Gu, a PhD student from Tomsk State University. Hello. Hello, good morning in Moscow. Good morning and good afternoon in Tomsk. Yeah. Hello. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, welcome. Uh, my name is Chong Yu, and uh, today I will present uh, our TMPA 2021 paper and paired image to image translation using transformer based cyclogram. Convolutional neural networks are the mainstay of computer vision today, thanks to their two core ideas local connectivity and parameter sharing. Transformer architectures are now displacing CNS in image classification, semantic segmentation, object detection, and GAN tasks. Transformer architectures possess strong representation capability and are free from human defined biases. CNS, in comparison, have a strong bias toward feature locality and the spatial invariance as a result of sharing filter weights between all locations. Transgan and VIT GAN, which are GANs completely free of convolutions, have demonstrated the probability for the undertaking of visual generative modeling. These transformer-based generation models demonstrate the ability to generate better quality images compared to CNS. We are inspired to investigate whether pure transformer-based architectures without using convolutions are capable of performing image-to-image -image translation. Moreover, we expect our transformer-based model to produce the better quality results than CNS. Our proposed model is a type of cycle gain completely free of convolutions using only tra pure transformer encoders. An encoder consists of two blocks. A multi-head self-attention model constructs the first block, while a feed-forward multi-layer perception with GLU non-linearity constructs the second. Both blocks make use of residual connections and have a normalization layer applied before them. On the left, it shows a memory-friendly transformer-based generator with several stages. Each stage contains several transformer blocks. We gradually increase the resolution of the feature map until it reaches the target resolution. Specifically, in contrast to transcan, the generator takes the source images as the input instead of random noise. We reshape the image into a sequence of flattened 2D patches and map to C dimensions. Then we combine the resulting patch embedding with the learnable positional embedding to retain positional information. The resulting sequence of embedding vectors serves as input to the basic block. After each stage, we insert an upscaling module that consists of a reshaping and resolution upscaling layer to scale up to a higher resolution image. The upscaling module firstly reshapes the 1D sequence of to token embedding back to a 2D feature map. It then uses the pixel shuffle model to upscale its resolution. This method upscales the resolution of the feature map by a factor of 2 while simultaneously reducing the embedding dimension to one quarter of the input. This pyramid structure with the modified upscaling stages mitigates the memory and computation explosion. The process will continue until the generator reaches the, mem the target resolution. Projecting the embedding dimension to three yields the RGB image. On the right, we use multi-scale discrim discriminators to identify real and fake images. First, we use varied patch size P, 2P, 4P to divide the input images into three different sequences. The most extended sequence is linearly converted from dimension three to a quarter of C. Then, con con then concatenated with the learnable positional encoding to serve as the input of the first stage. 
where a quarter of C is the embedded dimension size. The second and third sequence are also linearly converted and then individually concatenated into the second and third stages. As a result, these three distinct sequences can extract both the semantic structure and the textual informations. Between each stage, we adopt a 2D average pooling layer to downsample the feature map resolution. Before the last block of the discriminator, a class token is etched at the beginning of the 1D sequence and then taken by the classification hide to output the real or fake prediction. Here we present the architecture configuration of a transcycle gun. We evaluate our methods on a standard data set from image to image translation. Horse to zebra resized to 64 by 64. We follow the setting of transcan and use the losses introduced in cycle gun. We apply translation, color, cut out data augmentations during the training process with probability 1, node point 3, and 1. We do not employ gradient penalty typically used for training gas because it leads to serious discoloration problems. Our model reaches FID of 60.54 on horse to zebra 64 by 64 and 93.05 FID on zero to horse 64 by 64. Of course, it is better to compare these results with those obtained in other architectures. Since the benchmark resolution is 256 by 256, and the result we got for now is 64 by 64, it cannot be compared directly. Direct comparison will provide in our future work. We have introduced the TransCycle GAN, the first pure transformer-based GAN for the text of image-to-image -image translation. Our experiment on the house to zebra 64 by 64 benchmarks demonstrate that the great potential of our new architecture. TransCycle GAN still has much room for exploration, such as going towards high-resolution translation tasks and experimenting on more data sites. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and we have some questions. Uh, what is the average training time for your model? Uh, average training time is about uh, seven days. More over six, more be, uh, more over six days or seven days. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, a long time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what are the typical use cases of this approach opens door to? What optimization does it provide? Uh, uh, I, uh, this method is used for unpaired image to image translation. I, I have, have told I have told before. So uh, it's uh, unpaired image to image translation. You, we have one data set from, now, for example, we use the horse to zebra data size. It's unconditional uh, in the data set, in the translation, in the train uh, process. We don't have a mesh uh, data set. It uh, only, uh, it, uh, for example, horse to zebra or zebra to horse, orange to apple, apple to orange. This is the typical case of our our model. And mm -hmm. uh, what up, up the... What are the next steps for your project? Uh, I have I have written in the uh, in the presentation. Uh, the next step uh, for for uh, firstly is uh, uh, um, is sure to make our model to a higher resolution. 256 by 256 and uh, uh, we will combine our model with uh, uh, for example uh, CNN based uh, discriminators to to find if it's better for the results and uh, uh, we will make a new uh, method to find the latent latent space for the generator yeah this is our future steps Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. I see no question. Um, so um, we are waiting now for the next speaker. Uh, he's not. He's not connect. He he didn't connect it yet. Uh, so um, so I think uh, we can propose a little break. Uh, just for uh, 10 minutes and uh, please oh no uh, two minutes a uh, little break for two minutes please uh, stay uh, here don't leave our conference and uh, we uh, propose you to watch uh, a little video and uh, we will return in two minutes Welcome to the Exact Pro Systems YouTube channel. Here you can catch up on the latest technology updates in software testing and development for the financial industry. These include the applications of AI and machine learning, DLT, cloud computing, and many other technologies and solutions. You can find the recordings of our latest conferences featuring top-level speakers from global market infrastructures, world-leading banks, and technology vendors. You can watch the Exact Pro experts sharing their insights with the fintech community at events all around the world and with our subscribers in the regular Exact Pro Talks segment. If you're interested in the Exact Pro test tools released to open source, you'll find a list of tutorials here as well. We also put a new spin on some of the popular shows that we bet you've never thought were about software testing. This channel is for chief technology information and compliance professionals, product owners, and software quality assurance and development specialists of all levels. Subscribe to our channel, hit the bell button to stay up to date on all the videos, and visit our website execpro.com if you want to learn more about us.
So uh, thank you for being with us and we continue. Let me introduce the next speaker, Vasily Gromov, professor from High School of Economics. Vasily, are you here? Um, some technical problems, I think. Vasily, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Switch on your microphone, please. Vasily, you have some problems? I can no, I can't I can't hear you. Because uh -huh, now now I hear you. Sorry about it. But okay, no video. Start. But no video. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. Hello to yes. everybody. So let's begin. Please don't load my presentation. Not load. Mm -hmm. Very well indeed. Uh, dear friends, uh, it is my pleasure to present to your attention uh, a presentation linked graph is data driven graphs as complex networks, comparative study. And first of all, I would like to tell you a little bit about the motivation behind this research at ration date rate about this research. I believe that uh, everybody knows that um, a graph and its extension, a complex network, is a sort of default phase to analyze any complex system, any complex process, uh, internet, um, circulatory, human blood circulatory system. Uh, political maps of the world um, are examples of complex networks used to be analyzed and explored. Uh, more to the point, if we consider any process to test software, or if we consider uh, software, software itself, uh, most probably it would be a sort of complex network. Uh, what is the research question we are going to discuss today with you? Actually, if we can see the uh, usual, a conventional notion of graph, of a graph it's just uh, vertices and edges. But if we consider real uh, graph-like structures, it is usually something more than just ver the vertices and edges. Usually each vertex of the graph contains lots of information, graphical, textual, um, whatever. Uh, now it leads to two possible concepts to analyze such structures, such data. You mean forget about the data connected to the vertices and analyze the graph itself. It is called a link graph. You may forget about the topology, about the link you have uh, in your disposal and analyze only data associated with uh, Only data associated with the vertices, uh, just as we explore any data. It is called data driven graphs. Uh, modern attempts to analyze such structures 
uh, is usually boiled down to attempt to uh, squeeze both parts of the information, both lungs of the system, into the same model somehow. I'm not quite sure that it is highly reasonable for each possible application. And the main question here, whether it is possible to do this operation, whether it is possible to analyze simultaneously the topology, the structure, the graph itself, and um, information associated with the vertices. Uh, from the philosophical standpoint, they should belong to the same structure. They are produced by the same information system, which we don't know mm, completely. Uh, but from the practical standpoint, sometimes they are so different that it's no use to analyze them uh, in, a, in a unified fashion. So we try to solve this uh, problem. We try to explore this problem and we propose um, the same idea, the same uh, line of investigation. We propose to analyze graph, lean graph, and data-driven graph separately. Uh, and calculate, construct them, calculate their characteristic, and then answer whether their characteristic uh, are compatible. I don't uh, say I'd um, don't as though this, they could be the same, even compatible. Uh, to this end, to this end, we propose to use um, a theory of complex networks to use characteristics, to use concepts, to use ideas uh, associated with the theory. But first of all, our first step is to construct both graphs. Uh, if it comes to lean graphs, it's straightforward operation. But if it comes to uh, data-driven graph, it is not so simple. We have several approaches um, to this. The, uh, the uh, listed in the slide, in the slide, epsilon bow neighborhood graph, Gabriel graph, influence graph, and nearest neighborhood graph and uh, related neighborhood graph. Uh, so, so, so I allow myself to skip some slides due to the time is uh, is limited for us. Uh, so, notation as usual, a definition of graph as a pair of its vertices and its edges. V is a set of vertices, E is an uh, adjacency symmetric graph edges. X of V, a data associated with the vertex V. D is a matrix of Euclidean distances. M key, a set of key nearest neighbor. And O of X is a sphere with center X and radius R. So we could define uh, uh, using this notation, we could define, we can define several graphs, uh, several different data-driven graphs. Epsilon ball neighborhood graph. As usual, it's a usual definition. It's most transparent definition, most uh, apparent definition. VI and VG are connected if the distance between them is less than epsilon. Jebra, the Jebriel graph. V, I, and V, G are connected. Um, if we construct, if we construct um, a sphere, a hypersphere uh, with a radius, uh, sorry, with a diameter that connects V, I, and V, G, and if this hypersphere doesn't contain any other points of the sample, any other sample points, then we G and we, I and we, G are neighbors. 
inference graph uh, if the spheres of influence are intersected. Nearest neighbors graph um, if VG belongs to the sphere um, to the sphere uh, with a radius equal to the distance between VI and its K nearest neighbor. And finally, relative neighborhood graph. Mm. It use two hyperspheres, two hyperspheres uh, built on VG and V, VI and VG, and um, interested if they, there are no other points in the intersection. Uh, data sets. But we can see the three possible data sets. Uh, so they're not in this connection. Sorry, 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 a little bit. The first one, six degrees of France and Bacon. Uh, it's for me, it's very interesting. Uh, for me personally, it's a very interesting data set. Uh, it talks about social relation in the France of 17th century. Um, it connects uh, 15,000 uh, plus person, and uh, it's a vertices of the persons as the vertices of the graph, and uh, it uh, two vertices are connected by the edge if the persons mentioned each other in some historical document, some document uh, preserved till uh, the our time. Stanford University about um, a Stanford University data set about the goods that can be uh, bought or sold on the Amazon data site. Uh, the description is on your slide. Um, the two goods are connected if uh, they contain approximately uh, the description on the respective web pages. Uh, um, um, the description on the respective web pages uh, contain um, approximately the same words. And the third that is that so-called a minor collection about Twitter users, subscriptions, and actions. Uh, we use we used to we use following um, characteristics to describe the link graph and the data-driven graph. Firstly, it is um, a degree, so-called degree distribution. What is a degree distribution? Uh, I believe that everybody knows that each, uh, vertex, each vertex has such characteristic as a degree, as a number of edges coincided with it, as a number of neighboring uh, vertices. Of course, it is impossible to um, use, it is impossible to use a separate degree, separate characteristic for each vertex, for graphs um, containing uh, several hundred thousand of vertices, but as it used to be in a complex network theory, we are able to calculate a probability, to calculate, to estimate, to recover somehow a probability distribution of the vertices. Here's a probability distribution for six degrees of Francis Bacon graph, the French persons of 17th century, I mean. And um, I allow myself to stress that. Uh, uh, this um, the scale is a double logarithmic scale. It means that uh, 
we have something like power low distribution here. Of course, it is not a straight line as it should be if it would be pure uh, power low distribution, but, but it is something that closely resembles it. Amazon dataset. Here's a power low distribution. Uh, here's a power low distribution as it is. Twitter data sets. Okay, it is approximately parallel, at least for small messages, small tweets. Link graph characteristic. Uh, three data, three data sets, three our data sets, and the characteristic we used. The first one is a um, exponent of power law distribution. The second one is uh, the size from which the data fits the power law distribution. Goodness of fit statistics. Um, they are good enough. Graph diameters. You see that despite the graphs are very large, the graph diameters um, are as small. Uh, it points to complex networks too, and community sizes. The same information for data-driven graph for the respect, uh, not sorry, not the same information. Um, it's a correlation coefficient. So called assertivity information for SDFB graphs for all data graphs we have. Uh. The first conclusion here, the first conclusion here, uh, that the assertivity coefficient changed drastically when the graph, lean graphs are replaced and by the data driven graphs. Sometimes assertivity alters to disassertivity. What is assertivity and disassertivity? Um, just for the record. Uh, actually, actually, mm, all complex networks are classified by two large, broad, uh, broadly classified by two large classes assertive complex network and disassertive complex network. and uh, it really matters. What is assortative complex networks? It means that hubs are linked to each other. This assortative complex network means that hubs are separated from each other by a sequence of uh, vertex vertices with small degrees. And maybe the most important characteristic of any complex network, the characteristics that should be calculated first, it's, is its assertivity or disassertivity. They are qualified, they are quantified by uh, its assertivity coefficient. So the first conclusion is that if we use lean graph and data-driven graph, their assertivity coefficients differ. That's Peter. Mm -hmm. Data-driven graph characteristic, power low exponent changes, they are not so drastic. Small word property appears to be inherited to some extent to all data-driven graph as foiling graph. All the data-driven graph exhibit relatively large values of average clustering coefficients. And conclusion. Uh, most link and data-driven graphs contains giant components and community size power leave low distribution. It means that both of them belongs to the same domain, to the same realm of complex networks. The power low exponents of the respective distribution for both types of graph are in good agreement. 
Data driven graph possess small word properly and relate to the large value of clustering coefficients. Uh, epsilon ball and Z. Epsilon ball and ZG about low degree distribution are the types of data driven graphs. Normal. You see that these types of graph are not applicable to uh, to our purposes. The value of power experiment crosses the body between exponents. The yield finite mathematical expectation is also yield infinite. It's also a drawback because it means that we have two different uh, two different um, types. The assertivity coefficient is essentially corrupted with one moves from a link graph to data graphs. Sometimes assertivity alters to disassertivity. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I have two questions. Yes, so, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, you have questions. Um, Mohamed Furkan Ali, uh, a nice presentation. I appreciate your kind efforts. And how is your proposed scheme deployable for medical image construction? Uh, for medical image construction, um, of course, we haven't thought about this in such a way, but I believe that you know that each um, medical image is characterized by a certain kind of graph. Um, that's your right. And besides, if we um, consider the edges, oh sorry, the vertices of the graph, and um, account for I don't know any textbook on uh, anatomy and physiology, you um, obtain the same situation we examine here. So I believe that it is possible to apply these ideas to. Um, the uh, area equation to medical images. Mm -hmm. And the um, second one. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your talk. Uh, the question uh, Fit to power law is pretty uh, common in complex systems. So, um, but can we rule out other distributions? For example, law normal. Maybe I have missed that, but I don't think that you've tested the fit of them. And if you did, how would you compare the different goodness of uh, in values produced by uh, different tests? You haven't, haven't missed. I haven't mentioned it um, in the my report uh, just due to the times money. Uh, but we have tested it for normal, uh, for normality. And we have tested it for log normal distribution. They are not normal and uh, they are not log normal. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't tested it for variable distribution. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, also comment, for example, uh, Weibull stretched uh, exponential also has a heavy mm -hmm. long tail. Yes, it's, it's a known problem in this field. Mm -hmm. uh, but Frankly speaking, I would be happy. I would be happy if it would be variable distribution, and if it would be variable, the same type of, uh, the same kind of variable distribution for link graph and for uh, data-driven graphs. But unfortunately, the graphs differ. The graphs differ, and um, it makes us um, think about what um, types of data-driven graphs we should use, or rather we should create, we should design in order to work with complex systems. It means that mm, known types of graphs, at least uh, the types of graphs uh, known to the authors, um, are nearly unapplicable. That is the pathos of uh, the report. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I think uh, we have no questions. Uh, more. <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, we continue with the next speaker. Thank you, Vasily.
And now it's turn of Semyon Tkachev. Semyon Tkachev, a graduate student at Tomsk Polytechnic University. Semyon. Hello. Uh, hello, hello. <laughs> hello. So, let's start. Can, yes, you can start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hello, colleagues. Uh, my name is Simon Tkachev. I'm a PhD student of TPU, and now I'm glad to present our work on the topic. Uh, detection of flying objects using the YOLA V4 convolutional neural network. Mm. So let's start. Um, key points of my speech. Uh, relevance of the topic, architecture of the YOLA V4 CNN, Preparation of data sets, uh, training of the YOLO before CNN, researching of the efficiency of the YOLO before CNN, and discussion uh, of the results. So, The most important task uh, in airspace control is the task of localization and classification of flying objects. Uh, for example, various manned and unmanned aerial vehicles, birds, uh, and so on. Uh, for this, appropriate systems for analysis of data obtained in the optical, uh, infrared and other wavelength uh, ranges are being created. The radar systems of detection of flying objects are the most widely used. However, in recent years, images of flying objects obtained in the optical and infrared wavelength ranges have been increasingly analyzed. In order to detect flying objects uh, in such images, uh, computer vision systems based on modern CNNs are being created. Uh, this work uh, examines the efficiency of the YOLO V4 CNN in detection of two classes uh, of flying objects in images. Uh, first, helicopter type unmanned vehicle or just drone uh, and gliders. <clears throat> Such flying objects are recognized both in optical images and in images obtained in the infrared wavelength range. <clears throat> so, uh, purpose is to evaluate the efficiency of the YOLO before CNN. And objectives are preparation of data sets, researching of the YOLO before CNN uh, with various parameters, and analysis of results. <coughs> uh, where are two types of CNNs architectures for object detection in images, uh, one-stage and two-stage detectors. One-stage detectors are capable to detect objects without using a preliminary stage. In contrast, uh, two-stage detectors use a preliminary stage uh, in which uh, imported areas in space are detected and then we are classified to see if an object has been detected in these areas. Uh, so the advantage of one-stage detectors is 
that we are able to make predictions quickly, uh, which allows them to be used in real time. <clears throat> Viola V4 CNN refers to one stage detectors and consists of uh, blocks, um, input blocks, um, I'm sorry, input block is uh, source images. Uh, backbone block is used uh, to build a DPCNN in order to improve its accuracy. Nick block uh, is used to obtain rich spatial and semantic information. And dense prediction block uh, is used to determine the coordinates of the bounding boxes uh, along with the confidence score for the class. So, preparation of data sets. Mm. The size of data set of each class is about 5,000 images of which uh, one half is optical images and other half is images obtained in the infrared wavelength range. Um, to obtain such number of images of flying objects, um, preliminary data augmentation was performed uh, using operations of variability of positioning and image size, uh, operations of obtaining vertically and horizontally inverted images, and operations of obtaining images rotated at a certain angle, and so on. For training of the YOLO V4 CNN, 80% uh, of the volume of these data sets uh, were used and 20% uh, uh, for testing and researching. Mm, so, for software implementation of the YOLA v4 uh, CNN, the Python programming language, the PyTorch framework, and the Google Colab development environment were used. Uh, training of the CNN and testing uh, researching of its efficiency were performed on a Tesla T4 processor. When testing of the trained YOLO before CNN and researching of its efficiency on optical and infrared images, the following parameters of the CNN were changed. Input image size, mini batch size uh, and activation function. Uh, when training and testing of the Yellow V4 CNN, the following parameters were unchanged. Uh, number of epochs, learning rate, and the Adam algorithm uh, was used as an optimizer. Uh, on this slide, uh, there are examples of detection of flying objects in optical images and in images obtained in the infrared wavelength range. Uh, A is helicopter type, unmanned aerial vehicle uh, or just drone, and B is Glider. Uh, go to results. First, um, experiment number one was performed to determine the influence of the size of the mini batch and the size 
of the input optical images on the accuracy of detection of flying objects uh, using the YOLO V4CNN with the Likirilu activation function. The experimental results are shown on this slide. Uh, next experiment. Uh, in experiment number two, the accuracy of detection of flying objects in optical images uh, was determined, determined sorry, using the YOLO V4CNN for different activation functions and sizes of input optical images. The size of mini badge uh, remained unchanged and was equal to eight. So, the experimental results are shown on this slide. In experiment number three, uh, the rate of detection of flying objects uh, was determined using the YOLO V4 CNN for different sizes of the input optical images. The size of the mini batch remained unchanged and was equal to 8. So, experimental results are shown on this slide. Um, the following three experiments only the initial data changed. Uh, images obtained in the infrared wavelength range are used uh, instead of optical images at the input of CNN. Uh, on this slide, where are results of Experiment number five, six. So, analysis of results. Uh, the accuracy of detection of flying objects uh, in images using the YOLO V4 CNN changed insignificantly when using a uh, bag of ribbons and bag of specials. Uh, the accuracy of detection of flying objects in images using the YOLO V4 CNN is higher when using the niche activation function for different size of input images. Uh, the best rate of detection of line objects in images using the YOLO V4 CNN can be on pain, mm, sorry, can be obtained uh, with the input image size of uh, 4, 416 H416 pixels. Uh, the accuracy of detection of line objects using the YOLO V4 CNN uh, in optical images is 5-6% uh, higher than in images obtained the, uh, in the infrared wavelength range. Um, um, <laughs> so, conclusion. Researching of the efficiency of the YOLO V4CNN were performed in detection of two classes of flying objects in images, helicopter type, unmanned aerial vehicles and gliders. It was found that the accuracy of detection of flying objects using the YOLO V4CNN increases with increasing of the size of input images and the best results were obtained 
is using the MISH activation function. It's shown that the accuracy of detection of flying objects using the YOLO V4 uh, CNN in optical images is higher than in images obtained in the infrared wave flame range. And the optimate, um, sorry, the obtained estimates uh, of the rate of detection uh, of flying objects in images indicate uh, the possibility of creating a computer vision system based on the YOLO V4 CNN that detects flying objects in real time. So, thank you for your attention. That's all. Uh -huh. Thank you, Simon. We have so many questions. Um, let me start with a uh, simple question, <laughs> I think. How many classes of flying objects do you recognize in your research? List, please uh, list them if possible. Uh, first class, first class uh, is uh, mm, just drone, and second class uh, is glider. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, we have many questions from an expert <laughs> in UAV uh, systems. How do you cope with the energy issues in UA? Uh, I'm sorry, in AUUV uh, because limited battery capacity. Mm, just a moment. Yes, yes, I can repeat. Uh, I'm sorry, this abbreviation. Uh, how do you cope with the energy issues in uh, AUV because limited battery capacity? I understand. Um, um, we don't uh, <laughs> we don't uh, think about it uh, now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, we will think about uh, <laughs> uh, maybe uh, so it's uh, next stage of our next work. Stage. Yeah, it's, I understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are the communication techniques do you use in order to navigate or capture images, objects uh, through optical or electromagnetic waves? Mm -hmm. mm. uh, we get uh, images uh, from some organizations uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, I don't uh, tell you <laughs> about uh, mm -hmm. how we get uh, these images. Uh, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, secret? <laughs> yes. <laughs> secret. So, um, and then how did you model channel uh, through optical and uh, radio frequency waves? Simultaneously. Mm. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, the same. The same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I I don't know how. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I just get uh, ready images, uh, mm -hmm. and okay. my work is uh, mm, develop uh, uh, and check CNN. Uh, so, mm, mm -hmm. for example, testing uh, and. Uh, get some results and uh, report of these uh, results uh, to my uh, um, boss. <laughs> A research advisor, yes? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Uh, so um, the last question, what are the optimization techniques do you use in your corresponding work? Uh, <clears throat> mm. mm -hmm. uh, good question. Mm, just a moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, if uh, uh, question about uh, CNN, uh, so uh, with CNN uh, uh, use uh, uses um, Adam optimizer. Uh, uh, we don't uh, change. Uh, with optimizer, um, so we is uh, set default. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, if I don't uh, answer <laughs> this question, uh, what you mean? <laughs> uh, mm, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I understand because I, I know that uh, um, Furkan. Um, Ali, uh, he is also PhD student at Tomsk Polytechnic University. Oh, as you. Great. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you can contact him. Uh, he is uh, uh, studying now, and uh, he is uh, in Cybernetic Center. He, mm. His office is situated yes in Cybernetic Center. So you can uh, come <laughs> and talk <laughs> to him because I think that your topics are connected, are related. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, okay. so it was interesting. Mm, it will be interesting, uh, like a collaboration. Maybe you can um, uh, join in your research or in a, one project. Mm. So, uh, thank you very much. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, and also, uh, if you need uh, his contacts, uh, he his de contact details, so I can uh, give you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So, um, thank you, Simon. Bye, and uh, we continue. Bye. Uh, uh, now let me uh, introduce Dmitry Dubinin. Uh, from Tom's Polytechnic University, but um, I'm sorry, we uh, switch on uh, Russian language. Uh, Dmitry uh, will talk in Russian, but the slides of the presentation will be in English. So if you want, you can uh, write your questions in English or in Russian as well. Dmitry, здравствуйте. Добрый день. Здравствуйте, все. Я передаю вам слово, можете говорить. А, то есть мы не ждем э, это, времени, да, 35 минут? Нет, мы начинаем уже Прямо сейчас. Сейчас. Ага, все да. понятно, ага. Угу. Так, э, добрый день. <coughs> Значит, э, мне поручили сделать доклад по теме э, к формированию последовательности случайных оптических изображений, аппроксимированных э, одноуровневым, однородным, точным потоком восстановления. Значит, тема э, нашей работы связана с э, обработкой изображений. Э, в настоящее время большой круг научно-технических э, задач связан э, с использованием такой формы представления информации, как изображение. Э, изображение э, использ... является одновремен... одновременно и результатом, и объектом исследований в таких областях э, значит, деятельность, человеческой деятельности, как космонавтики, геологии, картографии, биологии, медицине, навигации, дефектоскопии во многих других областях. Известно, что реальным оптическим изображением соответствуют поля яркости, близкие к кусочно-постоянным функциям двух переменных, то есть состоящих из областей, внутри которых яркость почти не меняется ну, или мало меняется, и которые отделены друг от друга резкими границами, контурами. Значит, считается, что вот наиболее информативная часть, значит, содержащаяся в изображении, она как раз и содержится в этих границах, в форме их. Для того, чтобы выделить 
границы объектов, было разработано большое количество алгоритмов, методов. Ну, наиболее известные это вот Кани или Кенни, Шин, Кастон, Мар, Хилдрен. Ну, эти алгоритмы или методы еще называют контурными детекторами. Контурными детекторами. Значит, алгоритмы выделения границ объектов являются необходимым инструментом для решения различных прикладных задач в области обработки изображений, там, связанных с редактированием. Так, сейчас я переключу. С редактированием, значит, анализом, синтезом, восстановлением или сжатием. Значит, качество работы этих алгоритмов требует некой объективной оценки. Значит, в настоящее время для оценки алгоритмов выделения границ, значит, в качестве эталонных изображений используются реальные снимки. Вот, так, я немножко забегу вперед. Вот есть такие, такая диаграмма, методы и подходы к обработке изображений. Значит, есть аналитические, ну вот в настоящий момент больше... Так, сейчас. Ну, секунду. Так. <смех> Наибольшим спросом, что ли, пользуются именно экспериментальные. То есть берутся реальные снимки, и на них пытается выделить границы объектов, и таким образом значит, смотрят на то, правильно выделены границы, неправильно выделены границы. Вот. Но у, в том случае, когда используются э, реальные э, фотографии, реальные изображения, значит, у этого подхода есть... Э, Participants, we have some technical problems. Um, unfortunately, our speaker disconnected. Um, so, um, after this uh, topic, uh, we should have a break. So, if um, we have such big problems now, we can um, do. We can make a break now. And then we can start with his uh, presentation. Uh, please wait for a couple minutes. We can try to uh, handle these problems. So, um, I have also a little announcement. Um, if uh, uh, talking about your uh, proceedings, uh, I mean uh, publication of papers, uh, it will be a little later. Uh, I mean uh, proceedings will be published in Springberg, um, but uh, the paper should be reviewed also uh, by uh, experts from Springberg and then uh, mm, you can receive some comments uh, so I guess uh, they will be published in uh, next year in the begin at the beginning of the next year um, so
Меня слышно? Есть ли звук? Ага, извините, соединение разорвано было, не знаю почему. Так, ну я с этого места... Значит, да, да, да. Это. У вас есть время. Итак, угу. Итак, значит, подход, когда вот используются реальные изображения, да, есть, имеет ряд недостатков. Ну, значит, это выбор, ну, во-первых, это выбор самого снимка, потому что в этом случае идет привязка к некой предметной области. Значит, сложно, значит, под сделать какое-то общее заключение по тому, какой именно алгоритм выделения границ использовать, поскольку э, результаты будут зависеть от э, вот этого исходного снимка. Ну, к примеру, э, например, если специалисты работают в области создания э, систем безопасного вождения автомобиля, да, то, э, наверное, рационально, э, то есть они вполне логично сделают э, выбор э, вот такого изображения, например, на котором есть автомобиль. Ну, потому что он связан именно с, это, с их э, областью э, исследования. Но с другой стороны, э, значит, специалисты, которые будут работать, например, там дефектоскопии, будут, наверное, крайне недовольны выбором э, такого э, снимка, поскольку у них автомобили, наверное, вообще не встречаются. Вот. Поэтому, э, значит, э, тут возникает вот эта привязка к предметной области, во-первых. Во-вторых, сложно перенести результаты, полученные именно для данных снимков, ну, для там, группы снимков, на какую-то другую предметную область. Вот. И кроме того, самый главный это вопрос остается, а где находится в реальности, где находится граница между двумя объектами вот на этом реальном изображении? В идеале, конечно, значит... Яркость, то есть яркость одного объекта и яркость другого объекта, которые объединены общей границы, должна иметь такую четкую, четкое различие, ее еще называют клесенка. То есть яркость по одну сторону от границы имеет одно значение, а по другую сторону границы другое значение. Но в реальных снимках нет вот такого четкого перепада яркости между соседними пикселями. Она, как правило, размыта. Вот. И поэтому результат э, алгоритма выделения границ, он тоже будет иметь э, ну, такое неоднозначное толкование. То ли он правильно отработал, то ли он неправильно отработал. И причем дело здесь будет не в э, самом алгоритме выделения границ, а вот в, той, э, в том исходном изображении, которое он и обрабатывал. Значит, выходом из этой ситуации может быть... Э, может быть, использование искусственных изображений, вот, полученных с помощью компьютерного моделирования. Ну, Во-первых, этот подход имеет ряд преимуществ. Можно быстро проверить различные гипотезы, значит, упростить выкладки, значит, исследовать большое количество альтернатив. И значит, самое -то главное, это в этом случае... Граница, граница, которая разделяет два объекта на изображение, она четко известна. В, в ряде работ использовались простейшие искусственные изображения. Вот к их числу такое наиболее популярное что ли изображение – это изображение шахматной доски. Опять-таки, почему? Четкие объекты, белые поля, черные поля – Известно, где находится, такая, где находится граница, разделяющая два объекта. Но простейшее изображение, но потому и простейшее, что ну, изображение это, в общем-то, детерминировано, потому что создается вот эта вот сетка. Это не очень правильно, потому что в реальных изображениях нет какого-то детерминизма на изображении всегда каким-то образом отражается элемент случайности. Поэтому вот э, тут, э, тот метод э, подхода к обработке изображений, который мы предлагаем, он относится вот на этой диаграмме э, в, в, в половинке, во-первых, экспериментальные, во-вторых, раздел B, и вот основанные на вероятностном факторе. Э, значит, 
То есть нужно в изображение внести какой-то элемент неопределенности, какой-то элемент случайности. Так. Данный подход, так. Данный подход он э, был предложен где-то в конце 70-х, начале 80-х годов, вот работах Сергеева, Сойфера, Буймова. Значит, в чем суть э, вот этого подхода? Значит, э, изображение строится э, на основании э, простейших элементов или элементов алфавита. Ну вот на данном слайде показаны, э, значит, элементы э, основного, что ли, э, алфавита, э, которые был, были предложены в работах э, Буймова. То есть все элементы, вот они э, разделены на пять групп. Это э, ну, так называемый пустой элемент, то есть элемент, в котором нет контура. Э, есть элементы простейшие, это вертикальная или горизонтальная линия. Есть крест, есть вот такие вот уголки, вот четыре э, элемента. Есть такие вот тройники, тройнички. И с помощью этих элементов и э, значит, строится изображение. Там в дальнейшем этот, вот он, задаются вероятности, групповые вероятности появления каждого э, элемента группы, то есть отдельно вероятности вот, прост, пустого элемента, отдельно вертикальных э, горизонтальных линий, отдельно креста, отдельно э, уголков, отдельно треугольников. И далее идет построение изображения. <coughs> вот так вот э, эти простейшие элементы складываются, как мозаики, поэтому в работах там они э, называют, так, получили такое имя мозаики типа А, Б, С, Д, Е. И потом в дальнейшем этот простейший алфавит был расширен, там добавились мозаики типа F. Ну вот в частности, э, значит, предположим, э, сколько-то элементов значит, было уложено вот в этом в двухмерном изображении. Вот возникает вопрос, э, какой элемент разместить, во второй строчке, в третьем столбце, если известно, что предыдущие, вот, предыдущие элементы этого изображения вот уже получили такое-то значение. Значит, исходя из, э, тех, так, исходя из тех... Так, сейчас, сейчас. Вот. <coughs> э, простейших элементов, которые есть в наличии, вот в данном случае для построения значит, искусственного изображения, которое называется мозаика тип С, значит, на месте вот этого элемента в треть, во, второй столбце, во второй строчке в третьем столбце могут быть вот какой-то один из этих двух элементов, либо горизонтальная линия, либо такой вот тройничок. То есть он полностью соответствует тому, что вот будет продолжен вот контур, который в данном случае пришел со стороны элемента, находящегося во второй строчке, во втором столбце. Дальше выбрасывается случайное число, и в зависимости от того, как распределены между собой вероятности появления э, вот элемента с номером э, там, вижу, 168, по-моему, и 136, да, 160, э, так, 168 и 136, выбирается либо тот, либо другой элемент. Ну, для того, чтобы получить вот эти вот числа, чтобы это было удобно а, программировать, вот пользуемся, мы пользуемся вот такой вот формулой, а, по которой высчитывается это значение. И таким образом идет заполнение вот этих вот, а, значит, а, этого изображения, и получается встроиться вот такого, а, а, значит, вида контур. Так, сейчас, секунду. Вот можно на следующем слайде посмотреть, как, какие изображения в результате получаются. Вот такой вот набор, ну, в данном случае каких-то прямоугольников. Ну, для человека это сложно как-то воспринимать такого рода информацию. А компьютеру, по сути, без разницы, вот он видит вот нечто подобное или там какое-то реальное изображение. Для него тоже это значения не имеет. Вот такой был подход предложен в начале, в конце 70-х, начале 80-х годов, потом получил развитие в том смысле, что помимо горизонтальных и вертикальных значит, элементов были добавлены еще диагональные элементы. Вот. Значит, это уже было сделано. В данном случае, что такого нового значит, мы предлагаем, это... 
построить не плоское изображение, не двухмерное изображение, а трехмерное изображение. Вернее так, заполнить трехмерную конструкцию, некий параллелепипед. Но принцип построения тот же самый. То есть точно так же, в зависимости от тех значений, которые были получены на предыдущем шаге, с помощью значит, случайных, случайных чисел формировать вот такую вот, значит, уже как бы трехмерную такую вот фигуру. Значит, сейчас, секунду. Ну вот на значит, этом слайде показано. Если есть какие-то известные значит, элементы алфавита, то тоже простейшими элементами выступают не квадратики, а такие трехмерные фигуры, кубики. То вот опять-таки из множества доступных элементов выбираются те, которые, которые могут оказаться вот на данном месте, а дальше выбрасывается случайное число, и в зависимости от вероятности появления того или иного элемента и выбирается тот или, тот или иной элемент алфавита. Значит, в результате подобного процесса будет получена такая трехмерный ну, параллелепипед будет получен, причем вот проекция на ось x o y можно воспринимать как двухмерное изображение, а вот третью ось можно воспринимать как ось времени. То есть если провести срезы по плоскостью параллельной плоскости x o y то перемещая ее вдоль оси вдоль третьей оси вот, которая называется t ну можно z назвать можно ну, лучше назвать t потому что это ассоциация со временем мы получим некую последовательность из э, плоских изображений вот э, на данном слайде э, значит попытка такая показать то есть вот на в один момент времени мы получим вот не что-то подобное вот на такую фигуру. Во второй момент времени вот он э, контур немножко сдвинулся, то есть это как бы имитация того, что там объект, например, там тот же автомобиль э, переместился в какой-то другой момент. Вот он в третий момент опять про, этот, сдвинулся такой вот контур. Вот. И э, таким образом э, получаем не просто двумерное изображение, а некий поток, э, точечный поток. И дальше, далее можно этот э, поток использовать для того, чтобы объективно, дать объективную оценку э, вот этим алгоритмам выделения границ. То есть у нас уже будет э, такая некая связь между э, изображением в один момент времени, во второй, в третий, ну и так далее. То есть в результате получается э, такая вот совокупность таких э, значит, изображений, э, каждая из которых э, вносит в себе некий вероятностный фактор, вот. Ну и в дальнейшем это можно использовать для вот, э, получения э, ну, какой-то объективной оценки э, значит, действующих э, алгоритмов выделения границ, а также как, разработать, допустим, какой-то другой алгоритм выделения границ, который бы э, ну, учитывал некую корреляцию между различными изображениями в разные моменты времени. То есть, зная, какое было изображение в предыдущий момент, попытался бы использовать это знание как-то для того, чтобы выделять границы в следующий момент времени более качественно. Так, ну, для того, чтобы вот эти вот искусственные изображения получались однородными, требуется выполнение ряда условий. Так, сейчас я. Ну, во-первых, это очевидное выражение. Это сумма групповых вероятностей должна быть равна единице. Во-вторых, элементы, которые входят в каждую группу, должны вероятность их появления должна быть одинаковой. То есть, если у нас, допустим, вот четвертая Четвертая группа, так, четвертая группа состояла из четырех элементов, следовательно, вот эту вероятность 
которая R05, нужно разделить на 4, и тогда мы получим вероятность появления отдельного элемента. Вот. В этом случае значит, искусственное вот это изображение, ну, то есть поле будет однородным в любом месте этого большого изображения. Так, сейчас. Ну, в общем-то, что я суть я рассказал. То есть таким образом использование одноуровневого точного потока восстановления может быть использовано для получения случайных оптических изображений, что позволит устранить субъективность в оценке работы алгоритмов выделения границ или там, обработки изображений, ввести значит, в изображение вероятностный фактор. Вот. И таким образом создаются предпосылки для проведения такого многопланного исследования или там для, возможно, для разработки каких-то новых алгоритмов обработки изображений, вот, которые бы использовали знания значит, об изображении в предыдущие моменты времени. Но по теме публикации, по теме работы были сделаны публикации, они вот тут на слайдах есть. Так, слайд 6. Так, ну, извините, что тут получилась такая накладка. Ну, у меня все. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо вам большое за презентацию. Так, у меня есть вопрос, который мне передал член комитета. Угу. Да, к сожалению, он сейчас тоже не может присутствовать. Ну, тоже... Он попросил спросить вас, какие компании могли бы заинтересоваться данной технологией, или, может быть, эта технология уже используется? А вот у нас есть один из авторов, который работал в такой компании, угу. где он там, значит, ну, вы же знаете, что после, то есть при защите диссертации требуется же акты внедрения, да? Угу. Вот у нас Виктор работал в компании, которая как раз именно занималась дефектоскопией. Я этот, не помню, как там компания, но я думаю, что он ответит на этот вопрос. Здравствуйте, Виктор. Добрый день. Мы занимались дефектоскопией, анализировали разрывы труб водопроводные и канализационные большого диаметра. Вот Производилось сканирование, оптические камеры, лазерное оборудование, и потом производился анализ, как и что. Ну, на, на этапе э, квалитет зихерунг, то есть на этапе э, проведения э, качественной оценки работы алгоритмов, подборах параметров, были использованы эти технологии. Ну, это во-первых. Во-вторых, э, есть, э, в общем-то, определенные э, запросы с, э, с фирм, которые занимаются обработками изображения, потому что такой подход позволяет, вот как Дмитрий уже отмечал, очень тонко подходить к выбору определенных параметров, портировать алгоритм с определенных предметных областей в другие области. Помимо всего прочего, в общем-то, любой, ну, мы, как говорится, уже не привязаны к определенной предметной области, мы смотрим, как реагирует тот или иной алгоритм на те или иные изменения вот именно в среде самой. Я думаю, я всего приемлюще угу. ответил на этот вопрос. Да, спасибо. А, да, а еще вопрос. Uh, what are the pros and cons of your algorithm versus machine learning methods? То есть какие плюсы и минусы вашего алгоритма uh, по сравнению с uh, методами машинного обучения? Методы машинного обучения? Я не знаю, затрудняюсь ответить на вопрос плюсы и минусы. Мы просто не сравнивали. Uh, видите... То, что мы предлагаем, это не как улучшить э, обработку изображения, да, а как под, подготовить фундамент, который вот лежит в основании, для того, чтобы можно было бы объективно оценивать результаты э, ну, каких-то других методов, каких-то других алгоритмов. 
Вот мы формируем условия, а дальше можем применить один алгоритм обработки изображений, другой алгоритм, третий алгоритм, и, значит, дать, как бы, что ли, экспертное заключение. Вот этот лучше вот этого, потому что вот такая-то цифра, она вот у него получилась меньше, а вот у этого получилось больше. Вот. Например, ну, например, как тот или иной алгоритм обработки изображений работает в том случае, если на изображении есть большое количество, допустим, слабоконтрастных изображений, да? то есть вот Могут быть два изображения, у одного яркость, предположим, вот этих 10 единиц. Ну, имеется в виду, что э, изображение черно-белое, 0 соответствует значению белого, 255 соответствует изображению абсолютно черного. Вот один объект имеет яркость 10, а соседний, э, допустим, там 80, да? То есть разница довольно-таки существенна. А, скажем, другой случай можно рассмотреть, это у одного яркость 50, у другого 60. То есть вот эта вот разница, она небольшая. И, значит, и таким образом, а как же отработает, вот если у нас в распоряжении имеется несколько алгоритмов обработки изображения, да, то как, какой из них получит лучший результат, допустим, там первый, второй или третий, ну, условно говоря. Так вот мы готовим такой некий фундамент для этого. Можно, можно еще добавить к этому, что, Дмитрий, я полностью поддерживаю, что сказал Дмитрий. Здесь при сравнении различных подходов необходимо отметить, что можно достичь результаты любыми путями. Другой вопрос, что необходимо посмотреть, а какие же субъективные факторы влияют вот конкретно в данном случае. Если выбор изображений, на которых мы работаем, они искусственные, очень трудно повторить эксперимент. Очень трудно при определенных состояниях солнца, допустим, при определенных э, условиях погоды сделать то же самое в строго контролированных условиях. Мы под, позволяем, э, вот, предлагаем подход, при котором можно контролировать любую ситуацию, проводить факторы анализ в любом э, короче, методе и в любом в общем -то, ситуации. Вот. Я так думаю, что мы правильно ответили на этот вопрос, минимум, как мы его поняли. Так, только ты немножко оговорился, ты назвал изображения искусственными, а не искусственные, а реальные изображения. То есть в самом начале ты немножко говорил. Да, абсолютно правильно. Так, я могу присоединиться к дискуссии? Да. Значит, вот по сути дела, так сказать, в продолжении тех вопросов, и, значит, коллеги, а вот, допустим, такая ситуация. Всем известный пакет программ OpenCV. Там довольно-таки много различных алгоритмов. И, допустим, нас интересуют алгоритмы, которые сегодня используются при подготовке датасетов. Угу. Есть алгоритмы оконтуривания тех или иных объектов. Угу. Причем контуры могут быть и разные, так и контрастное это что-то, и размытое, и так далее. Так вот, да. сколь ваши... Э, подход или ваш, так сказать, математический аппарат, так сказать, может помочь нам, так сказать, вот нивелировать те негативные значит, стороны, которые имеет тот же пакет OpenCV при создании контуров объектов, при разработке датасетов, ну... которые для обучения тех же нейронных сетей используются и так далее. Yeah. Так, я не знаю, я просто не работал я, в этом пакете. В общем, я хочу отметить здесь определенные тонкости. OpenTV – это открытый пакет. Да, У него да. доступны, доступны да. если коды доступны э, в, в определенном языковом э, понимании этого слова, в смысле того, что если C-код доступен, тогда можно это проводить. А если C-код недоступен, то здесь ситуация такая. То есть вы получаете black box, да? вы работаете с black box, то есть э, вещи рекомпилированы, то есть вы работаете или же со средой, или же с определенными библиотеками. Нет, но ваше так... можно встраивать, по-видимому, это открытые, так всегда. Ну, если можно встраивать, тогда что, строим, да и все. Нет, ну, разговор идет о том, решаете вы задачу о контуривании, так сказать, когда вот контура, так сказать, ну, имеет разную Нет. контрастность и так далее. Не, конечно. Не, немножко конечно, не так это... поняли нас. Мы не решаем задачу, значит, выделения границ. Мы готовим изображение для того, чтобы известные контурные детекторы могли приступить к выполнению, к решению этой задачи. А далее, 
поскольку мы наши изображения, в наших изображениях мы четко знаем, где находятся границы, то можем объективно оценить работу вот этих вот контурных детекторов. Например, правильно ли он выделил границы в том месте или не в том. Граница состоит из одного пикселя, что желательно, или, например, происходит утолщение границ. Вот. Если разрывы вот в этом контуре, который выдал контурный детектор, вот такие, этот, и, значит, мы можем посчитать объективно, ну, вот, то есть, во-первых, задаться какими-то характеристиками, да, которые оценивают работу контурного детектора, а во-вторых, сказать, вот, получить численные значения, и тогда можно объективно сравнивать. Одну работу, ну, то есть работу одного детектора от работы другого детектора, а вот не на глаз. Понятно, спасибо. Mm -hmm. Ну, в общем, это интересно в этой части. Вот. Mm -hmm. Тут... Имеет перспективы, так сказать. Mm -hmm. ну, вот спасибо. конкретно в этой работе, то есть, как бы мы дальше стали развивать ну, эту тему, и теперь предлагаем не просто отдельные изображения, а, что называется, видео получить. Вот что. Хорошо, спасибо, Дмитрий. Угу. Значит, мы через Александра Ивановича Кочегурова на вас выйдем. Так сказать. Вот. Спасибо. Спасибо, коллеги. Угу. Спасибо. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and now we will have a break, uh, one hour, and uh, we will return to the work of the conference in uh, one hour at uh, 1 p.m. Moscow time or uh, 5 p.m. Tom's time. Mm -hmm. So see you later. Please join us after the break. And mm -hmm. uh, you can also discuss uh, interesting questions, ask interesting questions and discuss in our Telegram chat. Thank you for your attention. See you soon. Okay.
Welcome to the Exact Pro Systems YouTube channel. Here you can catch up on the latest technology updates in software testing and development for the financial industry. These include the applications of AI and machine learning, DLT, cloud computing, and many other technologies and solutions. You can find the recordings of our latest conferences featuring top-level speakers from global market infrastructures, world-leading banks, and technology vendors. You can watch the Exact Pro experts sharing their insights with the fintech community at events all around the world and with our subscribers in the regular Exact Pro Talks segment. If you're interested in the Exact Pro test tools released to open source, you'll find a list of tutorials here as well. We also put a new spin on some of the popular shows that we bet you've never thought were about software testing. This channel is for chief technology information and compliance professionals, product owners, and software quality assurance and development specialists of all levels. Subscribe to our channel, hit the bell button to stay up to date on all the videos, and visit our website execpro.com if you want to learn more about us. Всем привет, раз, два, три. Меня слышно? Да. А у меня тишина, потому что все молчат, правильно? Да, похоже. Do you participants? Нет, я вам не слышу. Так, а что сделать? Настройки. Видео, микрофон. Окей. Окей, мы вернулись. And uh, we continue our work at the conference TMPA 2021. Uh, now, let me, uh, let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Vladislav Feofilaktov uh, at uh, uh, Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University. Vladislav, hello. Hello. Um, Let's, okay. Let's begin. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Hello, my name is Vladislav Filaktov. 
I'm from St. Petersburg Polytechnic University and from JetBrains Research. Now I would like to present a project named Spider. Let's go. There are a few practices of the software development. The first one is modern software is usually not designed from scratch. In most cases, the developer actively uses external components, implemented usually as the libraries. This allows you to reduce design and development time. Mostly, external libraries are produced by the third-party developers. There are these libraries as, I don't know, black boxes that provide a public APIs. Of, uh, so, so users of these libraries can't control their implementation. There are some major problems with these components. They are to distribute them as is without any documentation, or it can be short and too informal. So understanding these docs is pretty hard, especially if uh, docs are written in foreign language. Description of API calls and types aren't enough. Um, the third one is, even if some examples are included to docs, usually they don't cover all use cases of the components. Example may cover only a few most common usage scenarios. And what should a programmer do in case of other scenario usage uh, that isn't listed in examples? And the last one, library component semantic is unclear to programmer. This is a problem that the developer to a misunderstanding of components usage scenarios or their organization that makes the beginning of integrational error. Um, they can be quite non-trivial and the developer need to spend uh, a significant amount of time to find them. On the slide shown, a trivial example of integrational error. We can see, uh, okay, we can see a code fragment that uh, show usage of file reader from the standard Java library. After class initialization, the programmer made a call of the close method. After it, he called the read line method, and in compile time, nothing happened. But in runtime, the exceptional will be thrown. This is a trivial integrational error, and our project is aimed to find error like this. We set up the next aims of our project. The first one, develop the approach that allows to find integrational errors. The finding process must be static, not dynamic. Um, and developer uh, develops a tool by implementing this approach. We chose Java bytecode as an analysis target. Also, we must evaluate the tool on real projects. This tool must be useful in the real world. We read about 20 papers publishing, published for the last two decades and analysis, analyzed them. So we found that. Um, there are many projects that analyze non-JVM-based programs. Usually their target language is the C language. Some of them require code changes to, for example, write a specification in the source code. We don't always have access to these sources and sometimes in code specification makes the code look terrible. And the last one, some of them don't support formal models to specify library behavior. Our approach is shown on the slide. We need, to, we need a way to specify library semantic and behavior. Also, we need uh, to formally define integrational error that we would like to find. And uh, of course, apply the static analysis method for automatic detection of integrational errors. In our approach, we are using LiPSL. LiPSL, sorry. Um, this is a declarative language that allows written component specification using extended finite state machines. LiPSL allows us to describe the structure of a library, its public API functions, and their behavior, and of course, library component behavior too. 
you can get more informational information about uh, LibSL in presentation, partial specification of libraries, application in software engineering by my co-author, keynote speaker of TMPA 2019, um, 19, Vladimir Itzikson. On the slide, you can see an example of code written in LibSL. This is only a demonstration fragment for spe of specification. We can see some environment in info such as the language version, library name, and its version in the first part of this specification. The first block is a semantic types block. It contains two semantic types and their fully qualified names. Semantic types are used as a bridge between LibSL types and real ones. The last major block is automation description. It can have some states that can be init states, finished states, or just states. Uh, should be between them, variables, and functional with their contracts. Yes, yeah, there are three types of states. Init states are used to um, mark initial state of an automaton. Finished states are used to define of automaton from shift from the state market as finished. It's defender types. Um, they are public API functions, this declaration in this block. This function require a name and can have optional arguments list with types, return type, um, contracts, and body. But it can be used to set automaton variables or to mark return value as an automaton. Contracts are starting with keyword require or ensures. This is the next part means error name that is used to mark to make a error more clean to programmer. It can have um, function arguments, automata, and global variables, literals, and basic arithmetic and logic operation. Now let's see what types of integrational error we would like to detect. We make some research and choose the next types. First one is API usage errors, and the second one is incorrect scenario of library usage. API usage errors may appear if function contracts are violated. Contracts define pre and post condition of the function. The preconditional precondition specifies the assertion that must be true when the function is calling. The, pre, the post condition specifies an assertion whose trust is guaranteed by the function if the precondition is fullified. The specification of contracts is important because contracts violation is one of the most popular bug provider. Error may appear if there are incorrect scenarios of library usage in the code. This is, for example, incorrect order of API function calls and incorrect finish states of automata. This is work. Uh, in this work, we are focused only on the first three types of error. Okay, now we are ready to see high-level scheme of our approach. Analyzer of the slide, analyzer on the slide uh, gets the main application and the library in input, also library specifications that must be represented as an approximated library. On the output, we would like to get integration error list. We build the prototype um, as target platform which is GVM. Also, we use LibSL parser to produce to process uh, LibSL specification and get it in the form of an abstract semantic graph. Hey, it's Jim. Okay. Uh, and as a static analyzer, we chose Kex. We called our prototype Spider specification based integration revel defect reveler. Kex is our laboratory's byte code, Java bytecode static analysis platform. It supports few modes of analysis and allow writing new ones. Also, it uses a special internal representation called KFG. Kex transforms um, a source program to logical 
predicates and fit them to SMT solver in order to analyze the code. As far as Kex works with bytecode, it can work with Java, Kotlin, Scala, and other JVM-based languages. There is a way um, that we use to check the correctness of library usage. We are using libcell specification as a library oracle. Based on it, we modify we modify KFG to informate Kex about correct library behavior. And finally, Kex analyzes the modified KFG to find integration errors. After all this work, we are ready to see the detailed scheme of Spider. The input of the tool uh, in the source prog is the source program, library, and specification. Since there may be no source code for external libraries, the tool accept, accepts the compiled bytecode to the library as the input. The application is also submitted to the input uh, in form of compiled bytecode. Kex uses KFG to represent and to instrument Java bytecode. Both KFG for the main application and for the library are built using the KFG model, uh, builder model. Then the KFG graph is used by the analysis model. Library specification is converted to an abstract semantic graph, ASG, in LibSL parser. The ASG represents information about automat, data types, variables, and other information. Instrumentation model modified library KFG aims to insert library approximation behavior into library model. Analysis model starts the analysis using the built main application, KFG, and instrumented library, KFG. It converts the program into predicate states representation and uses that free or black solver to detect defect to detect defection. Instrumentation model and analysis model were developed as KX extension. All components that were developed for the spider shown in orange blocks. On the slide, shown some information about spider. Spider is implemented as a KX model and was shown on the previous slide. It was written in Kotlin and as a KX, as KX, and uses the LibSL parser. Inside of KX, the is the KFG library that used to build KFG internal representation and the three or blackter as SMT solvers. In order to evaluate our project, we wrote some synthetic test project and select the real one. And we use um, famous library OK HTTP. OK HTTP. Also, we chose demo project curl that uses this library. We tested curl without modification and with some manually added integrational errors. The tests were successfully passed, but evaluation showed that we have some performance issues. As a result, we have uh, the first one. An approach was designed to find integrational integration errors. The second one. The approach was implemented as a tool named Spider. For now, we can't find any bugs, but we have a strong base to improve the results in the future. And the third one, we evaluated the current version of Spider and found that performance isn't as good as we would like to get. In the future, we would like to extend Spider for detection of the rest of integrational errors. Um, as I said before, current performance is low. So we would like to profile the project, optimize it, and speed up the code. And the last one, evaluate Spider on many countless project, um, open source projects, yes, to make sure about its abilities. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we have 
questions and one recommendation uh, from one of our participants. Uh, how about such a feature in Java? Uh, you can see uh, also Vladislav. Um, try in brackets uh, resource and spe specification, then uh, curly brackets slash slash use the resource curly brackets. Okay, um, I can send, say anything about this feature, uh, but this is only synthetic sugar. So I think this is uh, should be processed normally in our analyzer. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, your solution sounds uh, really interesting. Could you say how long it takes uh, to configure Kex analyzer? for each new external library? Um, in ideal world, perfect world, we don't need to configure KEX for each project. We should to write a specification. It can take a time, depend on uh, the size of the project, of the library, of course. Um, mm -hmm. For a simple library, it can take about, uh, I don't know, 10 or two tenths of minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Thank you. The next question, is it uh, dependent entirely on the external library documentation provided by project developers? Uh, so um, is it as good as uh, the documentation being provided or does it also have capabilities of in inter um, inferring the logic on its own? Mm -hmm. if, it, uh, if it doesn't have them yet, do you plan on adding them in the future? um okay the documentation is being provided or doesn't um mm -hmm. uh, i think the documentation its specification will be must be provided uh in the future in the perfect world and um we don't need to do anything special for our project mm -hmm. so thank you uh, what are your next steps in developing your solution? As I said before, we would like to increase the performance and we would like to make more evaluation on real world, on real libraries, projects, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Hi, can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you please open slide 15? with the kill scheme mm -hmm. and uh, my question is about yes. time and computational complexity of each block can you please just shortly tell oh. which one is the most difficult and which are just straightforward uh for process time yes time and the computational complexity yes uh, computation complexity is kind of hard to be calculated but okay i mean time uh, time and memory i mean and uh, okay uh, time and memory are most uh, consumed in the last block in analysis model um, we are using some solvers and they um, they like to eat as eat memory yes and process the time too so the last part analysis model is more hard in this um, topic. Okay. And difficulty from, from the point of view of a developer? Uh, sorry? So the, the last model is uh, you just took out of the shelf, right? You just you use the existing, the existing solver, right? Yes, uh, SMT solvers like and the other blocks, or collector. Yes, yes. And the other blocks are written by yourself, right? Yes, you're right. Okay, I see. Thank you. I will sign to in with a question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, uh, hi, actually, I have. Hello. Um, hello, yeah, uh, Andre Novikov. Uh, actually, I, I have reviewed your work, uh, and um, to me, the um, the most problematic point here is the library specification. So, any library that could be used potentially with uh, your analyzer should be first prepared uh, by its developers, as far as I understood. So, only only on the library developer can make the 
spec correctly, right? Um, not only f uh, specification can be right written by open source community, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and we believe that it can be easier that we'll that written um, fully documentation in our uh, natural languages. Um, actually, my question is, do you think it would be a problem for um, uh, the library developers to maintain such um, meta-language uh, description for, for each and every library? Um, we believe that it will not be a um, problem because uh, the main semantic of library uh, doesn't change in the um, development time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think it's more or less realistic? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. We we should continue. Just moving on. Uh, and um, next uh, four uh, speakers. Let me introduce you. Luba Konova, uh, Senior Project Manager. Dmitry Famin, a Senior Software Engineer. Andrei Novikov, Managing Partner and uh, Yegor Kolesnikov, Machine Learning consult uh, Consultant. Uh, mm, so, um, now we continue and uh, um, Thank you yes, very much. much. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. I see our presentation is on. Uh, hello, all online participants. Uh, happy that we are gathered together on such a wonderful uh, Saturday uh, to enjoy science a bit together. Uh, the topic of our um, research and approach for creating, uh, creating a synthetic financial transaction data set based on NDA uh, protected um, data set. This research was born uh, as a result of a SWIFT hackathon uh, 2021, which was uh, conducted in November. Uh, and uh, the aim of that, uh, the challenge uh, given at this hackathon was building synthetic data set required for AI-based product development, uh, uh, least protecting privacy. Uh, teams had to develop novel uh, simulation techniques that maintained the utility of the original transaction data, uh, least protecting the privacy of the institutions involved. And uh, we were um, given an uh, original data set, uh, which is a proprietary uh, one under NDA agreement. And the data set, the analyzed data set, contained around 400,000 SWIFT single customer credit transfer uh, messages. And uh, as uh, let me speak uh, in brief about what we see in the data, then it will be easier for you then to follow the logic uh, of our uh, generation. So as in transfer, uh, we have um, sender, which is represented by big uh, receiver. Uh, and uh, also the, there are corresponding uh, SWIFT fields, uh, ordering customer, uh, and uh, uh, beneficiary uh, customer. So these are bigs, but uh, for us, uh, ha happily for us, the, the bigs uh, in this uh, data set had been already obfuscated, so we didn't have to create an algorithm of obfuscating uh, big. So uh, there is a, a, an amount of transfer, which is a numerical value, and there was uh, ordering uh, ordering uh, customer and beneficiary customer. Uh, those are the clients uh, for, from who ordering customer uh, sends the uh, credit and beneficiary customer receives. So, and we had such, such personal and data such as accounts, passport numbers, name, addresses, uh, driving license, um, Etc. 
Uh, naturally, uh, the names in this uh, data set, the client names, uh, um, had been already obfuscated as well. So we had uh, uh, one numerical field that is uh, transaction amount to deal with. Um, looking at this um, data set, we um, started thinking, so what we would like uh, to keep in it. So this data set in future could be useful for data and uh, analysts. So our idea was that um, we uh, need to preserve as much uh, as possible uh, in it uh, to, to a certain degree. Um, and uh, we were looking what slices of data are there in this um, data set. For example, uh, government analytics, they might be interested in amounts and uh, geographical distribution of clients, for example. Central banks are interested in particular banks and currency flows between them. Uh, industry analytics uh, might, might, might be interested in some other dimensions. So there are certain levels that we, uh, separate levels that we wanted to keep. But uh, the concerns were that basic of, uh, obfuscation is potentially reversible. Uh, like uh, as an example, which uh, Andre uh, suggested, as everyone knows, the big uh, large vo volume retailer in the south of Russia. And if we even rename this retailer, everyone will uh, understand uh, which company is this. Also, there are, let's call them illegal um, analysts. Uh, who use the same machine learning uh, techniques. And uh, the question was, uh, what uh, valuable information is actually shareable and to what uh, extent? So we came uh, the, um, to the idea of adjustable uh, data set generation process for each of the uh, scenario. So uh, depending on the aim of, our, of the generation, we can, um, we can vary the precision in each dimension, uh, like geography, amounts, banks. If uh, we produce a publicly shareable um, data set, for example, we could add noise and big amount of noise on each of, it, of these uh, dimensions. If there will be a data set that could be sold uh, to some analysts and uh, and uh, as, a, as an asset, uh, then uh, a certain level of precision should be kept uh, at, each, at, at this dimension partic in particular and more noise added to other. And we also had uh, into taken into consideration the legislation that exists in the European Union and in our country as well, which protect uh, personal information. Uh, um, so... Uh, let's uh, move on to our generation uh, process. First, uh, as a uh, as natural step, we have initial data set, which we had to investigate, perform um, initial analysis. Uh, from And uh, the analysis uh, gave us the following, following information, how many unique senders receivers were there in this data set, which columns were blank, which columns were obfuscated, uh, which columns values interrelate, uh, how transaction volumes are distributed per sender, per sender receiver, per sender receiver currency, how sender receiver charges are populated, and uh, how ordering and beneficiary customers are distributed per sender receiver uh, in geography, let's say. Um, also, uh, mathematical graph uh, was chosen to um, analyze the structure of uh, banks and transaction between them. The node here represent each particular bank, edges uh, represent uh, transaction flow and uh, currency in which uh, uh, transactions are happening. So, um, So the first step of our generation pipeline was generating the bank currency graph. In uh, our uh, case, we chose to keep the original number of nodes and the number of edges uh, of the original graph and uh, connectivity rate, triangulation index, and distribution of volumes and currencies versus 
edge types. But uh, we uh, bore in mind the idea that in future, in future iterations of our research, we could think uh, also at this level how we could uh, play and modify this graph. We could add up uh, more nodes. We could switch a number of tr transaction uh, between them. Uh, we can glue certain banks together so they could be uh, obfuscated completely. Uh, so again, we could uh, manage the level of noise at this um, starting point as well. So we have um, completed the um, first step of our pipeline. So we had um, the generated graph and uh, then we started working within send and receive a currency container. And, um, now I'm passing the word to my uh, colleague, uh, Dmitry Fomin, who will talk about uh, the uh, generation of, uh, of geography in our data set. Yeah, thanks, Luba. So besides other data, we have information about the initial order and beneficiary clients, including their name, uh, zip code, street, city, and country. The goal of this part uh, is to assign this information to the newly generated customer. Uh, and for the name, street and zip code, uh, the problem is solved pretty easily. We just use Python Faker library that allows us to generate some random data. But uh, when uh, generating the country and city for the new customer, we have to take into account the fact uh, that it will be based on the address of the linked client uh, from the initial data set, data set. And uh, knowing uh, the address, we need to assign a new city not too far from the original one. Uh, it will help us keep uh, the geography related correlations. Um, to do this, uh, first we need to collect all unique pairs of the countries and cities and calculate the geography coordinates, uh, latitude and longitude. For that, we use an API of an online resource. Uh, it works quite quickly since such APIs have an ability to process a chunk of, uh, for example, 100 uh, addresses at once. But uh, it has some limitations, uh, such as the key that you need to get from th uh, that resource manually, and uh, that has a limit of uh, on monthly requests. Also, parsing the results, we can find out uh, that some results are uh, unsatisfactory. Uh, and for the latter, we use a Python library, library named GeoPy. It works with the only restriction that uh, each function call is uh, processed separately. And because of that, it can be time consuming. Uh, now, knowing where all these cities are on the map, we divide it by a grid uh, with a certain granularity. Uh, by the way, this granularity is the first parameter that uh, we can adjust. Uh, each sector defined by form two values and has its number. Uh, so uh, each sector is populated by the list of cities from the original data set. And we also add a user defined number of randomly picked cities within the same sector from a publicly available data set. Uh, this number per sector is the second adjustable parameter. And finally, to obfuscate clients' geography, we are changing the original city to a randomly picked city within the same sector. Uh, so this sums up uh, our geography obfuscation part, and Igor will now talk about other parts of the transaction generation. Uh, yes, thank you, Dmitry. Uh, let's discuss uh, generate uh, main generation process. 
So the first task that we face is to generate users who send and receive money. The end user is a client of a certain bank uh, and is attached uh, to a specific geographical area. And we characterize each client by two-dimensional value, the number of transactions he sent and the average transaction volume. At the same time, there may be some correlation between these two, these two values. Uh, so how we can generate new clients uh, while preserving the original correlations? Here, we can use special PCA trick. What it is? We have initial two-dimensional value. So um, uh, in this picture, it's the first graph. It uh, has two dimension and uh, strong positive correlations. Uh, what we do, we want to generate uh, uh, two dimensional data uh, with uh, equal correlation. Uh, we apply PCA transform to initial data with uh, the equal number of components. So after PCA transform, we uh, have uh, equal dimension, two dimension data, and the data become uncorrelated. After that, we shuffle randomly our data to generate new, par new pairs. Uh, at the same time, you can de increase or decrease the number of objects. And uh, the last step, we apply inverse PC transform, which gives us new data at the output with the state correlation uh, and the scale. Next, we need to generate new volumes of send and receive transaction and link them to the generated clients. In each container, send and receiver bank and currency, we have absolutely random distribution. Uh, it um, may look like uh, exponential distribution or it may be close to uniform distribution. Uh, so uh, uh, how to generate so random distributions? Uh, we split our data into exponential beams, for example, from 0 to 10, from 10 to 200, and etc. And uh, get uh, and we get probability uh, uh, to getting into each bin. Then we generate transaction amount. We select the next bin by the probability that we had that we have, and uh, by uh, and there in each bin we uh, generate specific value as uniform with boundaries of each bin. Now it remains only link our transaction with customers. This, this can be done in a fairly simple way. We know about each client, the average transaction volume, and the number of transactions. We can simply distribute new transactions according to these values. The last step left is to replace customer geographies with the obfuscated ones that Dmitry, uh, the algorithm. Uh, said Dmitry's previous section. To do this, we need find correspondence of new customers to the original ones uh, in terms of the amount of transaction volumes and take their geography. So let's look at this picture. Uh, here we uh, see our initial data uh, on, on the top and uh, some generated data. Uh, as, as I said, uh, our customers characterized by number of transaction and average uh, transaction amount. So we can multiply these two values and we we'll go, got a summary amount of transaction that customers sent on, or received. Now we have initial location of these customers. And we can simply uh, find the closest one to every generated customer and get the location of the original customer. So as, as you can see, like some around 2000, 
uh, this customer is very close to him. Then we got uh, the location of the customer, the obfuscated location, location, and that's it. We've got our generated data. Uh, thank you, Igor. Then uh, I will continue. So uh, with the with this process and techniques described by uh, Igor and Dmitri, we went through the whole uh, pipeline of our solution uh, at each stage, uh, monitoring our uh, metrics for each of the dimension, and we uh, received a obtained and fully synthetic uh, data set. Uh, but um, we can say that uh, many questions are yet to be answered uh, in future iterations of our research related to generation of this synthetic uh, data set. What, when can we say that uh, the generated uh, data set is uh, good for AI analysts? What metrics could that could be applied uh, to the data set in whole or to separate dimensions like amount, geography, uh, client base to prove that it's uh, suitable uh, for further analysis, but at the same time, it couldn't be reverse engineered uh, by uh, reverse engineered. And uh, also, uh, we need to think, uh, is it possible to keep all uh, correlations uh, in the data set and what metrics could show the degree to which we kept any particular uh, correlation in this uh, data set. Um, so these are the answers uh, which are yet to be answered because we touched only the top uh, small part uh, of the iceberg. And um, answering these questions is the uh, target of our future research. Uh, it's worth uh, mentioning uh, that we came second in the SWIFT uh, hackathon, which we are uh, very proud of and happy. And um, thank you for your attention, and uh, we will be happy to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you very much. We have some questions. So, uh, to what extent can obfuscation can uh, be made perfect, completely irreversible, if at all? I will copy this question to your to our chat. Maybe I will address this. Actually, actually, it's a philosophical question also because. Um, you know that um, the state of that maybe 10 years ago was uh, centered around um, things like one-sided functions. And the question there was uh, if, uh, if we can fully, um, fully restore the hidden information out of the uh, spoiled information. Uh, and uh, there, were, there were ways to, to make it irreversible. But here the question is a little bit different because uh, um, here, some some aggregated information could also be sensitive, and uh, only a business uh, a business common sense and maybe some legal consideration can um, can explain either it either this um, residue information is still sensitive or not. Uh, so, to us, it is a question of um, probably some years of business practice because uh, all this research is. Um, also granted by, by the fact that uh, the market of alternative data sources is uh, growing rapidly now. Um, and we have all that GDPR and uh, personal information laws. But um, in this new world of, uh, of external data sources of everyone trying to sell their information for money, uh, probably the new, um, the new ways to estimate the sensibility of the information will be invented. And um, we, um, in this research, we also uh, we only provide some kind, uh, some, some kind of approach to obfuscating this. But of course, uh, this is a question of several years of business practice. That is our position here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. 
<clears throat> maybe other questions? Mm -hmm. Let me ask one. So, in, in fact, you are creating a deep fake, right? <laughs> right? Of real data. <laughs> uh, so, so, did you think about maybe introducing some specific markers into your data set which make it explicit that, guys, this is really deep fake. This is not real data. So, that at least, uh, <laughs> at least it can be a little bit clear to you so that you can always prove no, this is not real data. It was created by our algorithm. Ah, like a digital signature. Yeah, yeah, kind of digital signature, yes, yes, yes. It reminds me cases uh, where uh, radio laboratories, I think they're still doing this. They're, uh, they're emitting signals, radio signals into the space um, so that if any align, um, <laughs> if, if, if any being on another planet ca catches them, uh, they should be sure that uh, this signal is generated by, uh, by by someone with knowledge of mathematics. Okay, uh, smart guys. Okay, at least yeah, yeah, a, yeah. <laughs> intelligent. <laughs> okay, yeah, something like that, just to prove. Because you know, there is another ethical problem of too many deep fakes around. And sometimes, sometimes it's difficult to realize whether I am in real world or in, in deep fake virtual reality. <laughs> so it would be nice to have kind of at least some marker. Okay, thank you. Nice point. <laughs> I think it's not a question, right? <laughs> it's just comment, yes. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that our conference is coming to the end now. So um, I would like also to thank all speakers uh, that uh, had presentation who had presentation today, to, uh, yesterday, and uh, I think that uh, we had very good discussions. Uh, I would like also to thank all online participants for their questions, for their comments. And uh, <clears throat> now I think it's time to close our conference. Uh, Rostislav Eduardovich, it's your turn, I think. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you all. Uh, I really happy. You know, we had this discussion always in within the organizing committee, and I always insist that, that the conference must be imperfect. So we always need some chaos to make it real and not just fake. <laughs> and I I think we succeeded. Uh, so we did had some uh, some technical issues and some chaos. So thank you all for contributing to this chaos. <laughs> <laughs> and thank, also thank you also all participants and contributors. And we'll have some mail about uh, how to contribute to the proceedings. I mean, to final version, but you probably you'll need maybe uh, several weeks just to introduce comments and the feedback you got now. And uh, a couple of words regarding the next year. We really think about being persistent, right, настойчивые, to try again <laughs> in Tomsk, because Tomsk is really a perfect uh, city for a conference. It's rather small. It's, uh, it has very, quite, very nice his history and historical building and beautiful nature around. So it will really try to, to get you here. So most probably the next TMPA will be in Tomsk. I hope real, in, to in Tomsk real, not virtual. So just uh, see the announcements. Uh, most probably it will be again in one year, in not probably in November, but October, something like that time. So I invite everyone to submit a paper and to come here for a conference. So thank you, thank you everybody again, and okay, see you. I, I see Anna. Anna, Anna yeah. Are you here? See you. you tell something? Yes. Hello, yes. everybody. Uh, I participated 
mainly today to the conference. I found that was very interesting and the presentation and hope that next year we will be also a successful conference. And thank you, Rodilas, for all the work that you have uh, uh, done in order to organize in very excellent condition the conference. Thank you. Thank you to Anna also that uh, animated uh, the different session today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. Definitely, we, we, we probably, uh, we, not probably, we have to mention Rana. Rana, are you here? Can you show yourself? Because you are among the probably the key person. <laughs> <laughs> now, organizing committee is yes, here. Yes, because now Anna uh, is known to everyone. Rana, more to cheat video. Are you here? No? Rana, ah, she's not here. Okay, but Jean also made a great job of organizing us and thanks to, to everyone and also great thanks to Exact Pro, our regular sponsor who who made all this happen. And okay, thank all. And all technicians, uh, all team of Exact Pro, you are perfect guys. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yes, thank you, all participants. Please, uh, please uh, stay in touch with our organizing committee. Uh, let me remind you that you will receive some gifts uh, and also uh, certificates of participant. Um, and I hope to see you at our next event. Uh, we will let you know our events, next events. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.